Um, okay, well, I think we're ready now for our um, panel discussion. This, this afternoon's panel discussion is on ownership. So I am lucky enough to introduce our moderator today, Yasso Thero. Um, Professor Thero teaches in the MBA and undergraduate degree completion programs at Alaska Pacific University. Her early career began, began with private sector accounting practices in her native land of Sri Lanka. For her doctoral dissertation, she developed a grounded theory of change by studying planned change processes at universities and college, colleges that had re revised accounting curriculum and pedagogy in response to AICPA's 150 hour requirement for the CPA certification. Wow, I can't wait to learn more about that. Um, her areas of specialty are financial accounting, cost and managerial accounting, financial management, international accounting, change theories and management, and grounded theory as a method of inquiry. So Professor Thero, I'm happy to introduce you. Over to you. Thank you very much for that awesome introduction. Can you hear me well? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I just want to say it's my pleasure to facilitate this conversation. Uh, welcome everyone to a panel on the exploration of ownership structures for small businesses. Um, uh, my name is Yasuo Thiru once again, and I will facilitate this conversation. The panel discussants are Kristen Barker of Co-op Cincy. You just heard from her fascinating presentation about co-ops and a marsh skill of Sitka Salmon Shares and Wadud Ibrahim of Portegra. I will ask them each to give us a one minute introduction, after which I will follow up with two rounds of questions. After these question rounds, there will be time for audience to ask questions of the panelists. Uh, please write them in the chat box and someone will curate those questions for you. And to the panel, and I'm, I'm, um, I am on a reduced screen here, so I just want to confirm all the panelists are here. And I want to say to the panel, please know that because I'm watching the clock, I may cut you off if you run over time, uh, not because I don't like what you're saying. Thank you. Right. Um, so each one of you will now have a minute to introduce yourselves. Um, and I'm going to ask um, Christian to begin. Thank you, Kristen. I'm Kristen, and I am a co-founder of Co-op Cincy and One Worker, One Vote. And we're about creating an economy that works for all through building a network of worker-owned cooperatives. And I'm passionate about shared ownership structures and Thank you, Christian. Um, I think there is a bit of a delay there. I just hope I'm not speaking over you. I will now ask um, Marsh to give his introduction, please. You have a minute. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Marsh Skeel. I'm a second generation commercial fisherman, and uh, I helped start Sitka Salmon Shares, and we sell wild Alaskan seafood into the lower 48. And I started the company because as a commercial fisherman, I wanted to, I believed that we were catching these amazing ingredients and uh, these beautiful fish, and I wanted to share it with people more. And in the commodity kind of marketplace for selling my catch seemed incomplete. So me, with, along with a couple of friends, helped kind of build a company that that incorporated cooperative part, parts of the cooperatives as like uh, we had fishermen owners to our company. So that's those, those supplier fish. And we also have some kind of staff uh, that are owners as well. So we're kind of a co-op hybrid and I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Mash. Wadud is off to you now. Thanks, Yasu. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, JEDC for organizing this wonderful conference. My first time uh, at this conference. 
which is really has been a great experience. Uh, I'm Wadud Ibrahim. I'm the uh, co-founder of a company called Protegra. We're a 100% employee-owned company. Um, I'm a, by uh, training, I'm a software and a business architect. Uh, I'm the co-founder of the company. Uh, we've been in business for about 22 years, almost over 22 years now. Um, I'm happy to be here. I'm looking forward to this discussion. I'm a big fan of uh, employee ownership. Thank you, Adud. Thank you, all of you. Um, this panel represents uh, businesses with diverse ownership models, as you will see. Uh, one is employee owned. The second is employee and supplier owned. And the third, a co-op. As you will learn from what you're about to hear, each model has its unique advantages in terms of customer reach, community support, and employee focus. You will also note that their form and governance structure differ in subtle ways. Further, there's one common thread in the three stories, among other things, their commitment to paid living wages to their employees. Audience, I hope you are all applauding now. I do hope you are. Okay, thank you. What we hope to learn from this panel are the pros and cons of these ownership models. So, now for the questions. Wadud, this question is for you. What is your motivation for moving from traditional partnership to an employee-owned company? You have two minutes. Um, we're trying to create um, a business that, um, the purpose of it is to create product and services, obviously like any business uh, to, uh, um, to the world. Uh, we're in the software business. So uh, we wanted to make sure uh, people innovate uh, people be able to um, have a, a great place to work. At the same time, um, be able to participate in the growth of the business. So not just to be cogs in a wheel for, for people. And so it's a great place to work, do interesting work, and more importantly, by having that kind of control of your own destiny, you'd be, it's easy to be purpose-driven. So you can have people following their passion, their interest, uh, be able to innovate, uh, feel that they are contributing, and participate in that growth of the business. So it's really more of a holistic approach to business and work and life, for that matter. And so that's uh, that has been the the uh, the motivation. And and I think that that reflects some of what uh, Kristen's presentation earlier was touching on about the advantages of ownership and how that motivates. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, the second question is to Marsh. Uh, Marsh, your business is a supplier employee owned. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the advantages of this business structure? Yeah, so I think the uh, the advantage is same as a, a having employee owners, the, the fishermen owners, um, you know, as the company grows, they they feel uh, like they can they can assist and the energy put forth benefits them too right so you know especially building a startup it's there's a lot of a lot of people do have, have to do a lot of different roles and it can be very challenging but when you have equity holders you're kind of in it together to try to build the business so we try to incorporate that uh that into with the fishermen um and so they, that that models worked really well as having fishermen ownership what about the customer side? Can you tell something about the customer side? Is this particular structure in some ways um, also engages customers you have? Yes, yes. So, so we we try to celebrate that in our in our sales because we're different. So we're paying kind of like the uh, like an employee uh, owned company would focus or a co op would focus on worker wage. We we do that as well for employees, but we also also for fair prices for fishermen. So we kind of celebrate that to our to our members that are buying our fish that, you know, when you're buying this fish, it's going to like a, a more of a fair, fair wage price for the for the fishermen as, as well. So that kind of they support us doing it. And then so we try to celebrate that. So they embrace it and keep the cycle going. So the, the revenue model is prepaid, right? Membership model. Yep. Pre, it's, it's some prepaid and some monthly. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, Kristen, um, 
I was going to ask you a different question about Mondragon, but I'm going to change that on you because you made a really thorough presentation in the previous session. So here's a question for you. Um, do businesses have a unique legal form to be considered co-ops? And for example, can a LLC be a co-op or can we say an employee owned business is a cooperative? So um, there, many states have a cooperative uh, legal entity. For example, Ohio has a really nice flexible statute. And that's what the majority of our um, co-ops fall under. But an LLC can absolutely be a cooperative. You just have to write the operating agreement um, to reflect cooperative principles and make sure that some of the key things happen in the sense of people being able to vest and be able to profit share proportion some key principles like that. Um, you can also take a corporation and write bylaws uh, that enshrine those same principles and possibilities. So what we hear about what dude um, and what he's talking about, like that's really exciting. Like my very favorite kind of ESOP are the 100% employee owned. Um, that's, as I mentioned, they can go from 1% to 100% and many are at 30%. Um, but that can, that can function quite similar. And it sounds like it from the beautiful examples he was giving about what life is like um, inside his his 100% employee owned firm. So I that what is happening there is their ESOP trust, the trust 100% owns that company. Um, so it's a bit of a different legal model than than what I'm talking about by changing your bylaws or your operating agreement or just um, incorporating within a cooperative entity. But it can have so many yeah, the same benefits. It was extremely exciting to hear about that. And and what Marsh is talking about too, to me, is, is absolutely the multi-stakeholder co-op that um that's awesome. I mean, I'm thrilled about all this fun stuff happening. Uh, and you know. So so in summary though, uh what makes a co-op is is the way it functions and the and the agreement that is it's that supports that function. So any legal form of a business can be operated as a co-op. Yes. Okay. That is correct. And, yeah. And some of the states in the union here too does have, yeah, you mentioned that, right? So it's a cooperative legal form is also available. Yes. Very good. Um, so we've, we've heard a lot of um, things about the advantages and the benefits of a co-op or um, multi-stakeholder model, employee-owned models. But this question has to do with, I just want to ask you about the challenges, um, if you will talk about that. But it's like someone comes to you and says, um, we want to start a co-op or we want to run an uh, entity just like you with the multi-stakeholders or ownership. Um, what are some of the challenges that you would say um, uh, that you face and how, what people should be thinking about in developing this um, or using this model? And I'm going to ask all of you to respond to this question. So I will actually start with um, Marsh and then Badood and then Kristen to address it in that order. And each one of you have two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great question. I think the uh, the challenge is with having the many stakeholders. Like for our business, we we have our own processor and we're buying fish from our fleet. But in general, the the fishing fleet doesn't have a uh, doesn't have a say in what the prices are. So like in a normal fish company, right? Like there's but but since we're a since we're kind of a cooperative model, we have fishermen on the board and 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 you've got all these different shareholders, I think it's like uh it's kind of like democracy where it's it's maybe it's the most just way to have everyone at the at the table discussing it. But sometimes it's uh it's not as efficient. You have to have lots of meetings and lots of discussions and trying to find out like the best way and in trying to be really transparent as a company is uh uh, is in it's the same kind of hindrances it's slower it's more there's more arguments and more kind of con conflict and meetings and so i think like the benefit uh 
the benefits are there, but it also, it takes, it takes the energy and focus. And I liked the kind of the, on the hundred percent business uh, employee owned, like it's a kind of a life choice. Like if you choose to be, to be like ultimately fair, it's going to, it's going to be, have some drawbacks. Thank you. Yeah, so my turn. Uh, yes. Yeah, it, it's um, there's two two challenges: one internal and one external. Uh, the internal is is uh, uh, Marsha uh, referred to is is one is a, of education. P what does ownership really mean, right? Is, does ownership mean uh, you know being involved in every day to day discussion or, or decision versus uh, uh, operation? So. So that, that's uh, something we had to work on a lot in terms of separating operating from governance. So uh, owners have, um, employee owners, can, they elect, uh, in our situation, they elect board of directors. So the board is actually employees who are elected by uh, by the employees. And so they have a, a, an alternate voting power at the board, uh, but the day-to-day -day operation is separate. So, so this way is really the education part. The other part is not all employees are the same. Although somebody would like to own few shares or some people would like to own more shares it's, it's it's level of risk so people are not all the same when it comes to risk taking so so we had to balance uh, we, uh the, the level of risk uh or match the level of risk of the of each employee with uh with with how much they they're, they're willing to take so so this way we create a you know it's up to you how much you want to participate in terms of ownership uh, so that that's kind of uh, another one that was kind of interesting and some of our employees choose not to own any shares because they think it's way too much risk and that's okay too and but that's the kind of but anyone can buy shares there's no there's no preference on on depends on your role or what have you so that's kind of internally the external challenge is really the in, uh, financing uh, investors don't like to give 100 percent employee owned companies money because they can't control them because we have a board. It's not like, oh, we can go to the owner and 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 have a deal with the owner. You have to deal with the employees because it's the board that controls these kinds of decisions. And so uh, it's much harder to raise money uh, externally, uh, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you. But, but uh, sorry, but I will not do it any other way. It's, this is the best approach though. So uh, that's okay. These are challenges, but I'll take those challenges over changing the structure. Thank you. Kristen? Yeah, so I guess the first thing that did come to mind was for our multi-stakeholder holder co-ops that we have here in Cincinnati. Like Marsh said, um, you know, different members have different uh, desires or goals. And so balancing those and figuring out how to get um, everyone through a process is helpful. On the other hand, um, all companies, for example, ours are, uh, you know, it's like um, Harvest, for example, is a worker and community owned co-op. So who we're selling to, we always do, I mean, all companies have to take their sellers, I mean, their customers' preferences into consideration, but you're right, it's a different one on your board. Like you, I mean, you got them right there. Um, uh, and in the case of our harvest, it's kind of nice because I think we have a lot of people that just really care about the full mission of our harvest, but still people have different you know, different preferences. And so balancing that, I think, is, you know, requires skill, but then um, I think also has incredible payoff because our harvest has had some challenges and some of our community owners from a financial perspective have come and been very helpful. Um, they've helped, we were able to do something, a preferred stock offering um, that really no one but someone who loved our harvest and loved its mission would participate in because it was so disadvantageous to any kind of like investor just looking to make money. But because we have this kind of committed community, we were actually able to have a positive with the finance. Um, what I was also going to say, I guess, to the point about people wanting different levels of risk and responsibility, that is also our experience. Um, we have some people that are in, in our cooperatives that choose not to become a worker owner because uh, they are concerned. They are very aware of the responsibilities and the extra meetings and the things that are part of it. And that's just not something that they're up for at this moment. 
development. So we work really hard to um, kind of encourage people to step in in those ways. And most people want that, but not all do. So, yeah, I mean, it is absolutely, it's absolutely our responsibility. And um, that is not what everyone wants, for sure. So, but I guess I just sort of, I just was just thinking about this. And I'm just going to throw this out here in case it's of use to people concerned about financing. Um, I'm on the board of something called the Seed Commons, which is a really cool financial cooperative that has peer funds around the country and is has about $23 out in cooperatives right now. So so I feel like if there's a 100% employee owned company <laughs> um, that, that, that has a board and it sounds so much like a cooperative, it, it feels like that would be an opportunity space. Just, just to kind of know, <laughs> it's a re it's a really cool thing that um, and that's out there. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, we actually promised the audience that they will have a chance to ask you questions. So, Brian, do we um, need to move to that? Are there any questions from the audience? Well, the audience questioning feature is live, so yeah, let's encourage the audience to ask some questions. And as those questions come in, Sierra will do the great work of telling the do you. Perfect. Thank you. I just wanted to add on to the the, the money raising. That it, it is challenging. On one hand, you're you're limiting the pool of the potential investors, as you said. They're like they don't like the messy cap table, i.e., a bunch of different shareholders they can't control. And you know, we we might view that as a good thing, but not everyone does. But there's also, I think, it also puts you as Kristen was saying, it, it kind of puts you in a separate class for the kind of socially conscious, eco-minded kind of investors too, because of that structure that you can draw you to some investors as well. We've been able to kind of cultivate that within Sika Salmon Shares. And uh, Kristen, there was a question on the, uh, just now, what was that resource you mentioned again? It's called the Seed Commons Cooperative. Um, it's a shared financial cooperative that benefits co-ops. Worker owned and um, worker owned co-ops is wonderful. Well, thanks to all of our panelists. The only other comment we had was actually, I, I admit out loud, it was from me to uh, sick of salmon shares about how much I, I religiously listen to NPR's wait, wait, don't tell me every weekend. And the last couple of weeks, it's been like support from sick of salmon shares, a cooperatively owned like fresh seafood company. And I just feel so tickled because what a fantastic Alaska business to to know that it's going out to everybody everywhere. So shout out to uh, sick of salmon shares marketing manager for putting that together. That was, that was a smart move. <laughs> But um, otherwise, well, thanks to our panelists. Um, any final thoughts before we let you guys go? You guys were great. Um, oh, I think actually, hang on, we might have one more question. Okay. Pull in there. Oh yeah, I see the question now. Um, so the question to the, the panel, can you comment on the history of cooperatives in the healthcare industry and how that might fit in now? I wish I could. I feel like I'm letting you all down by not. I'm wondering if anyone else knows. Um, I really, on it, darn, I'm getting nose. From sorry. The I see. Um, and from everyone I see right now. So I am so sorry to not be able to answer that. That's an awesome question. I feel like I'd be loving to do research and get back to you. Um, one of the things that I was just looking at is that how some doctors are forming cooperative practices um, at this time. And there's this interesting model where some people are taking the um, Medicare, apparently Medicare has a way in which uh, a group of practice can take full responsibility for its patients and keep them out of the hospitals. Um, so they, they basically are really 
really oriented to doing a lot of preventer to help keep their people out of the hospitals. And there's a kind of an interesting thing underway, but I know very little. Thank you, Kristen, for this. Um, I think we are running out of time. We need to wrap it up, but thank you so much for your contribution and all the excitement um, about this ownership structure and the co-op model in particular. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sierra.